So uh, to the next speaker, Dr. Alfredo Quinones. He is the William and Charles Mayo Professor of Neurosurgery and the newly minted chair of neurosurgery in Mayo Clinic Florida campus. He had moved there from the Johns Hopkins University after a very, very successful career. Uh, to be around Q as he goes by is, in my opinion, being around like a wireless charger. Uh, I think those of you who know him know what I mean. Uh, you, you spend five minutes with Q and you come away feeling motivated, more energized, you want to get back and do even better for your patients. Uh, and then I think that's probably one of the keys to us to why he's been so successful. Uh, many of you have probably read his book, Finding Dr. Q, and I've always wondered what makes Q so successful to a point where he went to Berkeley, Harvard Med, UCS of Neurosurgery, and rose to the ranks of Professor at Hopkins. I think it's keeping the mission statement simple, but I think it's not good enough to just have a great vision and a dream. I think without talent and a lot of hard work and sweat, those dreams are simply illusions in the sky. And again, I think you'll see from his energized talk, he's dedicated his life to that singular mission of changing the world. And he's kind of talked to us about how he's proposing to do that, finding innovative ways of brain surgery, combining the talents of individuals like Dr. Buckner, Dr. Rosenfeld, the other team members of the neuro-oncology team to better this world for those patients who need it, our brain tumor patients. So with that, it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Quinones at the stage and present to us his perspective of neuro-oncology in the 21st century. Thank you, Mark. Well, I think that we're going to have the computer, and if I understand it correctly, I'll be able to manage it from here. So um, thank you for that beautiful introduction, and thank you to follow the uh, uh, prior presentations and to precede the following presentations. I'm hoping that my presentation will put in perspective what was right behind, before me and what is coming up next. I'm going to try to keep it simple. I, uh, really, when I came in and I heard Steve talking, the level of complexity was a really, little bit too high for me, so I'm just going to try to come down to the surgical world and see if I can uh, put it in perspective for uh, many of us. Um, I am uh, now blessed to be able to work at this amazing place and uh, at the Mayo Clinic and surrounded by uh, the most amazing uh, brain surgeons, uh, spine surgeons, functional and epilepsy surgeons, uh, what I consider to be in the world. And I get to learn from them every day. I was just sitting right now with Ron and Bob, and I, am, uh, and I don't know if any of the other faculty is here. I believe Dr. Freeman in our faculty as well uh, in neurocritical care. I just see Cliff Solomon uh, enter in the room. He was a colleague of mine at Hopkins, and we spent a lot of time there, and he just came, flew last night to come to this course, for which I am ext extraordinarily grateful. So this is our campus, this is our place, this is where we work. A lot of you guys are familiar with the campus, some of you guys are not familiar with the campus. This is the, the uh, St. John's River, Jacksonville, the, the bridge, and uh, we get to spend this amazing time trying to uh, change the world from this uh, place. So I'll tell you a little bit about this and see if I can advance to the next slide. That's the backyard of my house as the march landing as we cross the bridge. And uh, we have the privilege of trying to work in cancer. Let me tell you a little bit about cancer to see if I can put it in perspective. By the year 2030, cancer is going to be the number one killer in the world. In the United States, it is estimated that cancer is going to be the number one killer by the year 2025. Most of you may not be aware that already in 21 states in the United States, cancer is the number one killer and is beginning to catch, as you can see by this graph, to the death rates that we used to have with cardiovascular disease. And we are today more or less at the level at which cardiovascular disease was about 25 to 30 years ago. So the new leaders, the new changes in medicine are going to come from this convergence of neuroscience. And I see Dr. Petrocelli in the back, and he and I are engaged in several projects that we're doing together. It's going to be in this new way of thinking about how to solve problems before they become a problem. And for us in the operating room, most of us are in the business of getting people like us out of business. The price that we pay as a society is in the order, in the United States alone, is in the order of trillions of dollars. The problem that we have is that we are ill-equipped 
to deal with cancer, any cancer. It turns out to be that one, it is the most expensive disease to care for, not only during your medical care, but following your medical treatment in, the, in our hospitals. So it's a tremendous burden to our society and one that many of us have dedicated our lives to try to understand and obviously try to unravel the mysteries of cancer. And I see a lot of familiar faces here who spend their whole life in trying to understand how cancer begins, how it continues, and how we can potentially put the brakes. And the talk before us with Steve is one of those talks and we just talked about the molecular engines that allow cells to move from one place to another. I will start with the management of one specific patient with a brain tumor. To put it in perspective as to how we still have, as surgeons, even though Dr. Trifoletti, which I see in the back, and next Monday he's going to be giving a talk about how radiation therapy is going to cure brain cancer, I still think that we as surgeons have a role to play, not only in the diagnosis, but in the immediate management and in the understanding of brain cancer today and in the future. This is a patient in which you're going to see a video, it's about a minute and 50 seconds, where we talk about a multidisciplinary treatment, several teams, including an endovascular team, allowing us to be able to use new technologies that allow us to take care of patients that maybe years prior we just couldn't manage. Thanks to the imaging advances that we have of the brain, we can not only be able to diagnose patients better, but we can actually manage them in the operating room. And let's see if this when video Jerry plays. the clinic, the first thing that I saw, I saw a young woman, age 40, with a history of unhypolindal. But what Cherry had was a tumor the size of my fist. And I knew that she was getting into that situation where things were gonna get more and more dangerous. She had undergone more than nine surgeries. One of the things that you have to consider about these tumors are the extraordinary challenges when you take a patient like this into the operating room. These tumors can basically explode in front of you and then suddenly the field is saturated with blood and you don't know exactly what wires you're disconnecting so you can leave the patient, you know, completely incapacitated. So we designed, Dr. Robbie Talk was gonna go in with the small little catheters and inject the small nanoparticles that would allow the tumor to die from the inside out. Deploying technology that only a few people in the world can do. And we were able to come in and surround this tumor and we were able to get the tumor out completely. The images show an amazing resection. You know, the images show a, a dream, an amazingly clean cavity, despite of the fact that this tumor, like I said, was the size of my fist. She's beginning to walk. She's beginning to get out of her wheelchair. She was shaking my hand. She had much better control of her legs. She is just amazing. So, one of the things, obviously, this is the testament of these multidisciplinary teams that really, truly allow us to care for these patients. As you can see right there, and this amazing patient that was actually asked to undergo a treatment with medication because they just couldn't offer her more surgery. They had already done nine surgical interventions at another hospital, and that's when she came to us and we presented the patient in, in our multidisciplinary team. And I remember talking to Dr. Warren, you know, I remember talking to Robbie Talk, to Dr. Reimer, and we realized that there was a possibility we can actually shut down the blood flow of this patient into this tumor that was considered not to be cancerous, but one that is to be thought to be extraordinarily dangerous when it comes down to bleeding. And it's exactly what I was saying, the wires that you're trying to disconnect, you really have a very, very poor understanding where your field is flooded by all this blood. So we were able to do a multidisciplinary team, use technology, and I think that is one of the ways in which we are going to continue to advance our understanding and our treatment of patients with brain tumors. Likely the patient has done great. Since then, Dr. Watrich and myself, one of our spine surgeons, did another surgery in another relative of this patient. There's a second part to this story that's gonna be coming up over the next few months through our Mayo colleagues. So I am extraordinarily blessed to be surrounding myself by amazing people that do amazing work. One of the challenges that we have 
in this work is how do we continue to build bridges between the technology that we have available, our understanding of the molecular mechanisms of cancer, how do we translate that back into the patient, and how do we use the operating room as an extension of our laboratory. And that's been one of the challenges that I faced a number of years ago, and I felt that it was important for us to continue to build those bridges. So I'm gonna to focus today, we already heard about medical management, radiotherapy, wanna hear more. I'm gonna focus specifically in some of the things that I am excited about focusing in the operating room. This is the work that is done by our team, a lot of papers, a lot of books that have been published over the years, an amazing team that surrounds us. This is our department of neurosurgery, the actual department is composed by many, many of our members. Several of them in orange have been prior chairs of our department. The Department of uh, the Brain Tumor Service, led by Dr. Reimer, who's right here in the back. He's going to be giving you a talk. We just have a few more recruits over the last few months, over the last year. So we continue to grow. And I'm going to focus into our ability to monitor the patient in the operating room with novel technology that continues to allow us to resect tumors safer and better. Why do we do this at a place like the Mayo Clinic? It's because we really feel that it is our responsibility to continue to put the needs of the patient at the forefront. This is the patient. This is a bilingual patient, and I'm going to see if this uh, video works, in which we use technology. This is the year before I came to Johns Hopkins. You'll see even a progress over the last two years in regards to neuromonitoring of this patient. In multilingual patients, all the languages should be tested. If clinical... As a destination medical center, one of the challenges that we have, obviously, is that we have patients that are coming from all over the world, Latin America, the Middle East, and we have to map in, diff in different languages. And understanding not only the function of the brain, but also how do we resect these lesions in a way that it is responsible, in a way that we maximize our extent of resection, in a way that we then utilize this tissue to send it back into the laboratory so we can begin to unravel some of these mechanisms is a challenge, but one that we decided to face in our group, in our team, and we continue to do that. In this particular case, we mapped the brain, we went ahead, and over the last year, we began to understand that there were ways to potentially understand not only the eloquent parts of the brain, that is a speech, motor function, understanding, production of a speech, what we call Broca's or Wernicke's areas, but also the actual somatosensory cortex. And we were able to uh, pair up and team up with Dr. Tatum, Dr. Feisa, Kristin, and some of our members in the operating room to continue to push our abilities to provide extraordinary care in the operating room. And what I'm going to tell you a little bit is a story about innovation that really was led by Dr. Tatum and our team in the operating room. It's led to two patents and some of the other devices that we're using in the operating room. We have not reached the pinnacle of our ability to resect these tumors in the operating room. I think that we're beginning to scratch the surface. So this is their work. The reason is, why do we do awake surgery on patients nowadays? You know, anesthesia has moved tremendously. I argue with a lot of my colleagues that anesthesia for a patient awake is much more challenging for the anesthesiologist and for the surgeon than it is actually doing a, 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 a sleep um, anesthesia for our patients. The outcomes, I'll mention a little bit about that. In my case, even in my own history, my outcomes have been improved when I, pitch, when I keep the patient awake and I publish on that. Stent resection over the last 10 years, I published all my data over 11 years that I did at Hopkins. It's improved quality of life, length of stay, all those measurements that I measure in a retrospective class three data obviously have been improved. The challenge is that this is class three data. This is not class one data. And this is the next frontier that we're facing at the Mayo Clinic with our colleagues and beginning to collect prospective data to demonstrate that we still have so much to learn in the operating room. We know that for epilepsy, those patients that have actually tumors, they tend to be a lot of patients that have epilepsy surgery that tend to have tumors. And this particular paper that was just published, it was actually sent to me by Dr. Trifiletti, in which we found that 24% of these patients had actually gangliogliomas. So we still have a tremendous challenge in understanding patients with epilepsy. We know that more and more patients are being diagnosed with epilepsy. The functional unit led by Dr. Warren and Dr. Tatum and Dr. Weedy is 
really one of the top places in the world to have this type of surgery, but we're beginning to understand that a lot of these patients indeed have actual tumors. In this case, it was 24% of these series are from Europe. We use the state-of-the-art technology in our operating room. We have the intraoperative MRI. This is actually a device that can actually allow us to be able to do good resections, and every now and then, allow us to go back and prevent the patient from going back into the operating room. This is technology that is already available. The challenge with this technology, as you can see in that image, we went back and we resect that part of the tumor. We could have left that tumor behind, not knowing exactly the border between normal and abnormal. The challenge with this technology is that it's quite expensive, and it's only a few centers in the world that are able to do this. So we have designed new technology that is allowing us to use imaging technology in the operating room that is much more fiscally responsible. In our operating room, we use not only cortical electrodes, but also depth electrodes to be able to record from the patient what parts of the brain are epileptogenic, so that way we take them out, and what parts of the brain are eloquent, so we leave them behind, allowing us to do better resections. We have published, this is one of our latest papers that were actually put by Dr. Feiza, that is in revision, it's in the last stages. He led this study when we use high frequency oscillations in awake patients. We are beginning to understand that in the operating room, some of the data that really we were not paying attention actually is very, very valuable, allowing us not only to map the brain and map the areas that are epileptogenic, but before we leave the OR, maximizing the chances that we can actually take those epileptogenic, this is the series of patients that we did last year as I came into uh, the Mayo Clinic. We kept all these patients awake, and they really need to be awake under no actual effects from anesthesia, so that way you can get the best potential recorder. This is the data that actually uh, Anthony put together in our patients. We know that high-frequency oscillations are prevalent in patients with brain tumor-related epilepsy. In our hands, they serve as surrogates of epilepsy, and in our case, also, we understand and we're beginning to understand that this epileptogenicity is related to the mutation of IDH1. So we are beginning to scratch the surface. We follow with what we call the periodic focal epileptoform discharges. And I'm just going to take you briefly to another part of this second study that Dr. Tatum put together with our postdoctoral fellows in the lab in which we image the brain. Before we go into the brain, we understand where we need to potentially put some of these high-density grids. These are the, some of the grids that we have patented, we have created. And we went ahead and record in the operating room areas that are eloquent, what areas are epileptogenic, so that way we leave the eloquent areas behind and we take the epileptogenic areas in the operating room, trying to push forward the limits of what we can actually do with surgery. We know that these, what we call periodic focal epileptoform discharges, are found in a lot of our patients. We didn't understand exactly what they meant, but we are beginning to understand that these are the areas that are very, very much related to patients not doing well postoperative. We used to take only the lesion. Now we're beginning to extend our resection and doing what we call supramarginal resection of our patients so that way we give them a better quality of life. This is one of these videos and or one of these pictures actually in which we, in the operating room, in which we map the brain. This is the device that I used to use before I came uh, to the Mayo Clinic, and I'll show you how we have evolved to be able to record this from the operating room. This is a, one of the cases, 53-year-old woman with a known history of oligodendroglioma biopsy. A number of years ago, these tumors were only biopsy and then treated medically, but we now know in class one data paper published in Lancet, another one in JAMA, that extent of resection for low grades does make a difference. This is the preoperative MRI, and you can actually see the eloquence. This is a tumor that you are going to see in the eloquent cortex on the right side. And years ago, these tumors were thought to be very, very risky. But nowadays, with the multidisciplinary teams in the operating room and the ability to map the brain, as you will see right here, we're going to go ahead and map the brain. This is a circular grid that we use in the operating room. This is another one of those grids that Dr. Tatum and I uh, have patented, and there's interest from industry and in potentially utilizing this for intraoperative recordings. We are mapping the eloquent part of the brain, and you'll see Five, both sensory six, and seven, motor in both eight, sides, and we're going to have a nine, narrow seven, corridor that would allow us okay, to go ahead and resect the tumor from the midline. So right. Here we are 
We are preparing everything, and at one point we're going to have a picture of the actual brain. This is all the recording. This is all the technology really pushed forward by Dr. Tatum and Dr. Faiz and our team. We're using the navigation system. If yeah. we use the intraoperative yeah. MRI as well. Yeah. We can also map in the back of your throat. throat. Right. We're mapping the sensory. And our goal, obviously, is to preserve the function of this patient and minimize the potential risk of injury. Now we're beginning to define our small window that we are going to use to be able to resect this tumor, and you're gonna see that window right there that is in the order of a couple of millimeters. So our goal now is gonna be to do intraoperative recording. We do the cordisectomy, we begin to define the borders of the tumor. This has to do with the actual biology. Some of these tumors are more amenable to be resected. Over the years, I also have minimized the use of bipolar to be able to preserve those areas of the brain. As I now beginning to understand that when we're using the bipolar, we're also creating a fair amount of hypoxia around the brain. And we now know that hypoxia is also inducible and permissible for brain cancer dispersion. Here we are. But that's disconnecting the tumor from the middle cerebral. We are going around the tumor, defining the borders. The patient is wide awake. We're monitoring the speech, language, sensation, motor function, and all the different factors. And at the end, we are beginning to disconnect the tumor from the vessels. You can actually see with the camera right there. And the patient is talking, you can hear in the background. So once again, pushing the borders of uh, tumor resection and also sending this tumor back into the actual laboratory for a study. And at the end, we have a good resection, and you will see the post-operative MRI. We're using the navigation right here, and uh, we will go ahead and get a post-operative MRI, which is this right here, and you'll see the resection. There's a very good resection. I'm sure there's residual lesion, as you can see above, in the areas that were more eloquent. We did both cortical and subcortical stimulation. So I would say that this type of technology is allowing us to do better resection of this tumor. And in return, we send this tumor back to Dr. Petruccelli, who is beginning to do single cell analysis of not only the core of the tumor, but also the periphery of the tumor in our attempts to unravel the actual mechanisms of migration and mechanisms of invasion. These are some of the pictures that come actually from the grids that Dr. Tatum and I have patented over the last year or so with an attempt to be able to resect better tumors. This is the actual image. I think it's a, um, uh, el uh, illustrating, obviously, in this particular case, another one of these cases in which we had to do a resection in the temporal lobe. Uh, we have the skin incision. We have the resection. I'm just going to move right here a little bit as we are beginning to go into this right here. And I'm going to move right here. This is the second grid that we patented. This is a slightly different grid that allows to stimulate in between the grids. These are high density grids. We're mapping the eloquence. In this case, it's a left-sided temporal lobectomy. We found Broca's area. We have after discharges. We now we know what those after discharges mean. In some cases, we can resect that and maximize the outcomes of these patients. So we are beginning to understand and study this with the Center for Innovation and the Center for Healthcare Delivery because we are following these patients now prospectively. So in this case, we did a resection of the tumor, and we were able to uh, maximize the resection, and here we are under the microscope uh, doing a uh, resection and recording postoperatively. So some of these devices are continuing to give us the ability to uh, take care of these patients, do better resection, send this tissue back into uh, the laboratory to study, to begin to unravel the mysteries of this. So now, I'll conclude over the next five minutes or so, how do we use other technologies that we have uh, begin to use in our laboratory? A number of years ago, this began with a very simple uh, observation into uh, one of my uh, postdoctoral fellows in 2008, Sarah from Italy. She was actually collecting fat from an animal. She wanted to use that fat and collect stem cells to use as controls because at the time, we were beginning to collect brain tumor stem cells from our patients, and we wanted to have some sort of control. And I told her that in our patients, I do about 50 to 100 pituitary tumors, and some of them we collect fat, and a lot of this fat is just wasted. We decided to get an IRB, and that led to several publications, another R01 grant, in which we began to use this fat 
that we published several papers in which we modified it and we use it as a Trojan horse. This is a picture that is in our laboratory of a horse that was handmade by one of our students and was a gift to me a number of years ago. She did her PhD in our laboratory. And we use these stem cells. We modify them not only with viruses, but we modify them with new uh, novel technology, in this case nanoparticles, to be able to deliver a cargo. In our laboratory, we break the studies into what are the molecular mechanisms that allow cells to migrate and what kind of therapies can we use to uh, load cells, in this case mesenchymal stem cells from fat, with either viruses or nanoparticles that use estrogen astro horses. These are some of the covers of some of the articles. This is one of the latest articles in which we use. And this one prior, in both cases, we use viral technology. And this last one, we use non-viral technology to be able to uh, treat animals with human tumors. The challenge that we have is that a lot of these animal models are immunocompromised animal models. But most recently, thanks to Sujan, and I don't know if one of our postdocs, Sujan, is here, we have an immunocompetent model also available in our laboratory in which we can implant human tumors. For the first time, we can ask questions of immunotherapy. And I link this to the following talks that we will have after this. This is a clinical trial that was really led by um, Dr. Reimer, in which we are planning to use uh, dendritic cell vaccine. This is supported by Northwestern Biotherapeutics, I believe, as a disclaimer. They are also working with us in a trial, several trials in our laboratory. And Dr. Reimer can tell you a lot more about this phase one clinical trial that we are working uh, with our colleagues in several uh, departments within oncology uh, at the, the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And I know uh, Dr. Parney is going to give you a talk about that. Uh, in this case, uh, 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 Ron has moved forward with working with Kai and not only doing that for patients with metastatic brain cancer, but also with diffuse gliomas in the past using cellular therapy and also for uh, a lot of these uh, patients that have recurrence cancer in this case, uh, combination with other treatments, as you can see, checkpoint inhibitors in this case, and most uh, recently, obviously, also used intraoperative. These are all surgical technologies that we're putting forward through different technologies, catheters in the operating room. We begin to treat the patient in the operating room before the patient leaves the room. I told you I was going to link back to the imaging. MRI, intraoperative MRI, is a great technology. The problem is that it increases the time in the operating room. The technology is quite cumbersome and is difficult to obtain and it's quite expensive. So over the last few years, one of our graduate students came to our laboratory back in 2009. Carmen began to work with Chinde, who's a physicist, talking about conversion neuroscience, which is really a concept that I learned from Dave Freeman, who's really the person who's led this, uh, this uh, uh, meeting together with Betty and, uh, in, in, uh, in June. So they're really the, the people that need to be acknowledged for this course. But David came to me thinking about convergence, and I began to think about some of the greatest things that we have done in our laboratory, thanks to other people who have, have come in and helped us. In this case, we use optical coherence tomography, led to our understanding that indeed we can detect human brain cancer infiltration, in this case, ex vivo. This was a, patient, a, a paper that we published in uh, Science Relational Medicine, and then uh, led to a uh, patent, and then led to the application of this into the Mayo Clinic now as we are opening our destination medical center as we already collected about 17 patients in our first human uh, clinical trial. I'm going to go back, if I can go back to that picture uh, right after this. This is the first human clinical trial that we launched in this picture right here in Mexico last year in which we collected 17 patients and now we're about to uh, open our IRB to be able to do it at the Mayo Clinic. This is a device that you use intra-app that is much less uh, complex than actual an intraoperative MRI that allows you to see cancer cell infiltration. We've done all the ex vivo studies and now we're in the process of launching this technology in the operating room. Fiscally responsible technology, much less expensive, allowing you to extend your resection safer as well, combined with awake craniotomies, combined with intraoperative electrocorticography and physiology, we believe that this is going to be the next frontier to helping our patients that have cancers that are considered to be inoperable. In addition to this, I leave you with some of the thoughts as to what I think is going to be the next five to ten years in regards to technology. This is another technology that we patented with Hong Gang, another chemist at, uh, at uh, Hopkins, uh, the one before with the nanoparticles, 
was with Dr. Jordan Green. Also, we co-patented that technology using nanoparticles for local delivery, for uh, manipulation of stem cells. In this case, it's self-assembling drugs, and they can only happen through the expertise of this amazing chemistry that Hong Gang did over the years, and this is Paula working in this project. We have all the gels, we have all the preliminary data already in a paper that she's finishing, in which we know and we demonstrate that the survival in animals that are implanted with human cancer is significantly improved, and this is another R1 that we have in progress right now in our laboratory. So there's no question that we have tremendous opportunities still to use regenerative medicine. I talk about cardiovascular surgery, how they were 30 years ago where we are today. We are moving the fields of molecular imaging. We're using robotics. I know Selby is one of our spine surgeons who's leading this effort. But most recently, with Eric Nuttmeyer coming back in our faculty, undoubtedly we're going to begin to move the field of robotic surgery, not only in the spine, but also in the cranium. So we still have opportunities to look and push the field of surgery and look at ways of treating patients with brain tumors much better.